There's loads of great stuff in this episode, but listen, before we get going, I would love it if you could subscribe, but as well as that, just hit the notification bell as well, because as soon as there's a new episode or something fresh from all of us, you will get it first. But for now, grab a pen and paper, because I think you might need to make some notes on this episode. It's full of brilliant takeaways. Enjoy. Here we go. It's an absolute pleasure to welcome Sol Campbell to the High Performance Podcast. Hi there, Sol. Good morning, gentlemen. So, what is high performance? Uh, for me, high performance is um, sacrifice, you know. Um, you know, commitment is, uh, is, a, is a big thing for me, but sacrifice is, uh, you know, so many people want to get to the top. Um, they speak about it. Um, they say all the right things, but there's a lot more to it. You know, behind the scenes, you've got to really, you know, that commitment. Um, sometimes people, people sacrifice it and, you know, uh, everybody, everything goes by the wayside and, you know, your family, your, your friends, uh, you just want to get to the top. And then obviously you want to stay at the top as well. So um, when you're up there and if you, if you have pushed everything aside and when you do get to the top, you don't want to let it go and, um, and some people almost have a little sort of like 10, 15 year block, blockage with, uh, with the, not the rest of the world, but with everything outside trying to kind of, you know, not derail, but just get in the way. So you really are concentrated on getting to the top and not allowing anything to uh, derail you. And, you know, I want to stay there as long as possible. I, I work hard. I'm, you know, I'm playing my football and I'm getting better and better but I'm not going to allow anything you know, to get in the way. And, and there's other guys who, you know, do it in a different way. And, you know, they have their families and things like that. And, and there's nothing wrong with that. And they, and they, they cope and they, and they make, the t- make it to the top and stay at the top as well. So there's different paths, um, but uh, definitely sacrifice is, uh, is one of those and commitment um, and consistency as well. You know, be con- more consistent than everyone else around you. And if you get a team that is is maybe 70, 80 percent of consistent players, um, then you uh, you're onto a winner. So which one are you then, Sol? Are you the the person who makes a bit of sacrifice, but then at some point decides that family is also important and going out is important and running businesses is important? Or were you the guy who, as you said in your own words, for 15 years blocked out the rest of the world and it became about one thing and one thing only being successful? Yeah, I mean, for me, it's all about, you know, my family. You know, I, I, I've come from a big family, a you know, working class back in Stratford, Plasto. So there, was, there wasn't much, uh, um, there wasn't um, the opportunities around. Um, so, and I kind of, you know, I, I grew up in the, uh, in the 70s and into the 80s. And I just saw what was happening around me. I, I saw some of my friends just um, go, but not go by the wayside, but there's no opportunities and you do get distracted. You do get just distracted. And if you're not strong within yourself, yeah, you, you go off the rails and you, and you almost disappear and you take a totally, totally different path. And I wasn't like that. I, I knew what I wanted to do. Um, you know, I love football. I didn't know that I wanted to be a footballer, but I knew I loved this game and I love being around it. I lo- I'm a competitor. Um, I'm a street footballer, so I played a lot of football in the streets with uh, older kids, and that kind of really uh, toughens you up as well. Um, and I just knew, and I knew when you know it started to go. Say my friends wanted to do something different, which was not really um, uh, the proper way of kind of living. I knew where to kind of cut the line and say, "Guys, um, I'll see you tomorrow at school" or something like that, and. Uh, I just went home or, or just carried on playing football in my back garden or whatever. So I knew from really from from early on that um, my discipline was there and I just wanted to, you know, I love football. I didn't know I wanted to be a footballer, but I just loved the game and I wanted to get better and better at the game. So that discipline, Sol, um, that really intrigues me. So where did you develop that? I know you said you grew up in a, in a big family and I know that your parents were first generation uh, Jamaican immigrants. Where did that sense of discipline come from? I think it it comes from something in, you know inside me, um, my environment, my 
my mum, my dad. My dad was really tough. My mum was loving. Uh, it was a, probably a nice balance. Um, and also, I was, I was just switched on, and I, I looked around my area, and I, I saw guys, um, you know, enjoying themselves, as you should as a, as a young boy growing up, but then kind of losing it and going on a different path. And I just had something inside me saying, well, a little voice saying, look, no, this is not the right, this is not for you. Um, yeah, you can enjoy you know, your mates and have a laugh when they're playing football, but once they, I don't know, one, once the dusk, you know, once the night time start falling and they start drifting and then all of a sudden, all of a sudden the, the mindset changes, um, that's when I just kind of said, right, that's it, I'll, I'll see you tomorrow. And I, I think it's definitely my parents as well, the discipline they, they had for me. And something inside me, just just something different about me, saying, "Well, this is not this is not the way to to do it. This is this is not you. This is not you, Solzier, Jeremiah Campbell. This is not you." Um, so uh, it was just you know it was a combination of it. I wonder whether your parents then sort of almost um, whether it was the love or whether it was the discipline made you feel a bit special. Made you feel like you're not one of those. You've there's more. You've got more in your life. You're going to do more than just go out and have a few drinks and nick a car and get into trouble. I think for me, um, they always wanted the best. Um, coming from Jamaica, it was you know, and, and come you know, first generation into um, you know into London, into the UK. Um, it was tough for them, so they wanted the best for their sons and daughters, and um, you know, not always it worked out. Um, but uh, they tried. You can only try as a as a parent. Um, but for me, it comes down to what is inside you. What is inside you? How do you feel? How do you look at the world? How does the world look at you? Uh, and vice versa. Um, your kind of natural intelligence, not intelligence that you learn from uh, books and things like that, that natural awareness of, of what's good and what's bad. Yeah, sometimes it gets blurred, but there is, and sometimes you make mistakes as well as a kid and, that, and that's acceptable. But um, something kicks in and something inside you say, the line, I don't want to cross the line because I know where that's going. And sometimes you've gone down that line and you cross the line and it's not ended up <laughs> in a good place. So you, that's the way you, uh, you learn as well, um, through mistakes as you know, growing up. So um, that for me is, uh, is one of the things I, I learned from the streets and my parents uh, and also seeing my friends, you know, fall and seeing my friends kind of go down the wrong way. And, and I just knew that's not for me inside me. So, you know, another person would have said, you know what, I'm jumping on that and uh, I'm coming along with you guys. Uh, and it does happen with, with a lot of footballers as well. It does happen uh, with a lot of people around the world growing up and you're in those kind of, you know, difficult kind of backgrounds and environments that that's the only way kind of um, to earn money or, 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 or to get out of that lifestyle. So, um, yeah, but it's was it one particular know, incident, Saul? So, um, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt. Was it one particular incident that sort of cemented this moral compass for you that you thought this is the right way to do it? Because to be so young and have such a clear sense of right and wrong and what your morals were seems pretty exceptional. Uh, I think <laughs> I think it's when I was I smashed the window once and uh, I um. I kind of went back, went back to the scene, and uh, someone saw me, and then they found out and they told me, told my dad, and I, he had to pay for a new window, and uh, I got a clip around the ear roll, a bit more than that anyway. So <laughs> I started to work out, you know, this is this is this is not the way to kind of um, uh, act and um, and carry yourself. So uh, I learned pretty early on, you know, the rights and, and wrong. And what about when, when football started? I'm really interested to, to know how that mindset was beneficial to you. Once you left home, you went to Lillishaw, you know, you were on that select group of people that at a very young age were identified as being exceptionally talented. You went from a crowded home to a very different environment. Hmm. What, what did that complete independence offer you at that point? And how much did the things you'd learned growing up in central London help you? Do you know what? Um, I... I... It was been um fantastic kind of balance for me. Yes, I've got the street kind of um, you know, learning football in the streets and things like that, and a little bit of school football, a little bit of district football, but my, 
eighty percent on the sh- a street footballer. Street footballer. Growing up, growing up, and then you know getting into Liddyshaw and 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 getting that kind of classical training, um, and yes, I'm, I came from a very very crowded home, and then and then went into a little show that I had my own bed, my own wardrobe and um, simple, simple things that, you know, my kids, you know, can't even dream of, you know, how I used to live. Um, and another four guys in the room, in the dormitory. So, you know, it was a nice balance for me. And I, and I learned a hell of a lot just being in that environment. And, you know, I, I had a fantastic time at Liddyshaw. I learned the street football to kind of be thinking outside the box as you have to do as a street footballer, you know, jumping over the gates and playing, you know, against, you know, I'm, I'm nine years old and I'm playing against 12 year olds or whatever. So you've got to work out, you know, I'm not strong as them, but you've got to work out how to beat them. Um, so you bring that kind of thinking outside the box kind of mentality and then you get classical training and you, you don't, you, you, you allow both sides to kind of grow and, and not diminish. Because then as you go, as, you, as I started to get older, I started to feel less, you've got to know the rules and the games of the game, but then also to set yourself from, from the rest, you've got to have something special as well. So don't allow the, the kind of, the, the football that made you great as a, you know, seven, eight, nine, ten 10-year-old, don't allow that to kind of disappear. You know, that, for me as a coach as well, I, I like doing that. I want, uh, you know, the players to kind of express themselves and, and don't lose. I want something special there. I want to get, I want to get to the heart of you. What's you? I, I want that, I want to take that special kind of, you know, talent out of you and, and explore that and let it grow as well. So I love, you know, players who express themselves and things like that. So for me, the balance between Liddyshaw and street football was fantastic and it gave me discipline. It, it taught me, you know, you know, you've got this opportunity. Don't let it go. Don't let it go. You know, I had some friends there. Um, well, I still, I still have friends uh, from Liddershaw. They had a slightly different kind of, uh, um, you know, upbringing, you know, well to do. Everybody saying they were going to be the next uh, best thing or from centre forward to midfielder to def- defenders. And I was kind of always on the side, you know, just growing up and my family was on the sidelines and shouting, you know, you're the best, you're the best. I had to do it all myself. But these guys grew up and, and, you know, it, it, it changes and they disappear. And, you know, within two, three years, they're, they're out the game. But I was hungry. You know, I was really hungry. I came there. I wasn't good. I had a f- attributes, but I, my long distance stuff wasn't good. My I was quick, but I didn't know how to get even quicker. You know, things like that, which I was taught there. But then I carried on. I started doing, I would. I remember my, my training week would be, you know, Monday, Tuesday train, and then you have a half a day and, and then you have, you would you and you train and you you do a workout on a I think on a Tuesday uh, long distance or circuits and then you you'd watch a game we usually went to Villa or Manchester United on Saturday we played Sundays so I remember I used to do all that and on a Saturday morning I've done a workout you know on a three thousand meters or, or or shuttles in the week plus training and I'll do another session you know uh, repeat that session to get better because I was kind of way behind all the other guys. And I said, oh, well, I, I'm not having this. I remember I needed, I was maybe second from bottom out of 16 guys. Even one of the keepers beat me, but, you know, I was thinking, what am I doing? So I kind of set myself, right, I'm going to work, I'm going to work, I'm going to get it better, I'm going to get it better. My fitness, my 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 my, my uh, speed, my endurance and speed as well. So I did all those works, then played on a Sunday. I couldn't believe it. I was doing all that at 14 years old because I was so behind everyone, but I had that pride in myself, real pride. So I'm not going to allow you know, a goalkeeper to beat me. No, I'm only really joking, but I'm just saying, you know, I, I was second from last. I did that for six months. Not six months, yeah, about three months. And then they did another test. I was joint third, and all the guys in the in the uh, in the change rooms, the, the list came up, came out, and they couldn't believe it. They were saying, "What what souls they doing up there?" <laughs> it was three months ago. It was fifteenth out of the sixteen guys. What's he doing up there? And that's the work, and the work ethic, and and the and the respect, and the um, you know, I I wanted to do the right thing, and. I, I knew I didn't want to waste this opportunity. They, were give, they gave me a lot of information about my body, my you know, circuits, and, and they were very good. There was a guy called Craig Simmons, a fantastic guy there for the uh, FA. And um, he taught me a lot about my body. And I, I kept going. I would work out before I went to sleep in the showers and things like that. I would do my 
burpees and all that kind of stuff. And I was I was kind of hiding, making sure none of the lads saw me. So what are you doing? Do some extra homework or doing some extra work? So I, I didn't used to tell anybody. I used to have a shower, wow. workout, and then go to bed. And so I used saw- to do all those things with no one knowing. And just and then all of a sudden the lads saw me on, on one session and did the three thousand, the shuttles, and the speed the speed work. And all of a sudden I was third, and they just couldn't believe it. I said, you know. I put a lot of work in behind the scenes. See, so that really intrigues me because whilst I like the story of you sort of going and doing the extra work and I really admire that sense of independence, what really stands out for me there is the courage not to follow the pack, not to do what everybody else is doing and still go and follow you, like your own path, do your own thing. How difficult was that, though, to be able to still go and do those extra works and, and then face the criticisms of being a creep or, you know, trying to impress the uh, uh, the bosses rather than being admired for well, it? Well, no one, no one saw me. No one saw me. The, I, I remember one of my friends, um, his name's uh, Junior McDougal, and he was at Tottenham at the same time with me. And on the Saturday, before we went, uh, before we kind of uh, set off to you know, Villa or I think a couple of times with Derby, just Midland Cubs and, you know, all over the place. And um, he used to see me walk off uh, um, in his room. He, see, he used to see me walk off on a Saturday uh, by myself with, uh, you know, I used to have a couple of balls and things like that. And he used to, he used to wonder, where's he going? Where's Solzhe going? But I used to go back to the training ground. I was doing my shuttles and... Um, and he, he he actually, you know, I met him, you know, I, I know him really well. And I think about three, four years ago, he mentioned, I, I used to see you see you do that every week. And I, I used to say, well, he was all right, at, good at uh, long distance running. So he didn't have to do that. But he, he actually admired, looking back now, he wished he would have done more stuff, you know, to kind of um, improve on whatever he needed to improve on. But I had a discipline to say, do you know what? I've, I've you know, I've, I've got nothing and in a sense that you know, I'm, I'm, uh, I need to kind of, I need to catch up with the rest of the lads. I'm going to work and work and work to get to the top, and that's what I did. What is this strange thing, Sol, that I've identified in football, just in my role as a as a broadcaster out, outside the game, looking in, which I haven't seen in the athletics when I've covered that, or Formula One when I covered that. This kind of, this. This desire to not be a swap. They talk about being busy, don't they? For ex-players yeah. sitting there go, oh, he was busy, he was busy, he was always doing extras. Oh, what? And then they also say, like two breaths later, wish I'd been more dedicated as a player, wish I'd taken care of my body, wish I'd done the extra bits. And I'm thinking, hold on, you still haven't managed to connect the dots here. That That's all those other players were doing was the extra stuff that got them to the top. What is what is that about football? It's a, It totally confuses me. Uh, I I think... When you're in a top side, that goes away because everyone's doing extras. Everyone. When you're in a team that has, you know, a mixture of quality um, and guys who are, you know, they're not in, they're playing football, but they're not really committed. They're, they made it and they don't really want to get, they're, they're, they're settled. They're happy where they are. And you got a mixture. Then it might it might start to come out. Oh, he's busy. He's doing an extra things like that. You know, just to kind of almost cover themselves and make themselves look important. But I think when you're in a top side, everyone's doing extras because you. If you don't do extras, you look like the odd one out. That's what I, that's how I saw it. I used to have that. You know, at Tottenham, you know, some would do extras, some wouldn't do extras. Um, when I was at Arsenal, nearly everyone did extras. Do you know what I mean? Even free kicks or a bit of running or a bit of kind of two touch or whatever games. Everyone did extras. No one just went straight in. So I think it comes down to the quality and the mentality of the team um, wherever you are. And also I think the manager as well, you know, you, you kind of, you know, there are guys who maybe, I don't know, maybe back end of their careers, things like that. And um, totally forgot when they were younger, when, you know, you had to do these kind of things. And, um, could be a generation thing, but it depends on the quality of the team. So jumping forward a little bit then, Sol, how do you as a head coach go into environments and handle seeing that mix of responses? Some players staying behind and doing the extra, some of them it's difficult. sneaking off early. Like how, <laughs> like how do you process that and how do you try to change that culture? Um, slowly, but you have to kind of try to implement it um, 
quick enough because you 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 can just say say the first two two weeks you can see the deficiency in some of the players, and you can see one player you know or t- say three four players, and then the lead of the pack and then they all go in and then there's only one or two left out, so you got to say right how do I keep the leader as a leader of the pack packs uh you know engage and what sometimes I do I I kind of extend the training to to kind of say no the training's not finished. Uh, this is the last session. So, so I kind of add another 10, 20 minutes or 15 minutes really just to get in certain things by adding in the training so it's, it's kind of official. If you if you leave them to their own devices, some of them will just, will just go in every day and not do extras. So you've got to be clever about it um, and implement it into the training. Ah, oh, you go up. You, you know, I don't think you have to do that, but definitely there's some, you know, there's some uh, uh, situations you have to kind of tweak the training to kind of uh, mask what you're trying to do. Now, it's part of the training, but really it's kind of specific kind of areas like shooting and, you know, crossing and things like that. You kind of mask it and you get what you out, you get you get what you um, put into it. And uh, and they they don't even know, well, I'm not saying I'm, I'm trying to trick them, but they do it. And then all of a sudden after after a month, they get it, and then you might say, "Right, the training's finished. You fancy doing extras?" And they might continue it, uh, and they do it on their own kind of accord. And that's what I want. I want. I want to give the responsibility to the players. But in the beginning, if I don't know everybody, and I don't know some of them might sneak, not sneak off, go off, and I've had enough, I have to kind of put it in, and then after about a month or two, allow them to say, "Look, do you fancy doing some more?" And then I know if they're really committed about their, their job. And what are you like, Sol, with the people who you've given them a month and you've pretty much laid the groundwork for this and they still choose not to do the extras? How are you with them? <laughs> um, do you know what? It's uh, If I need to get, you know, results and someone is particularly kind of, um, they're not, um, you know, game-wise, there's something, you know, um, they're down in, in, in one part of their game and I need to get that up to the proper level. I will say no. You got to. I will actually pull them apart. Pull them and say, look, no, we're doing the session. But I'll pull them because I know it, you have to do that. You can't allow. You're in a situation that, that you need to get. You know your wins. You need to. You know improve the team. You need to move up the table, or you need to get out of regulation re- relegation, or you need to win. You need to get whatever. You need to do this. You cannot allow. You know it to. to it's just to fester and continue without getting checked and then come Saturday or Tuesday or Saturday, it affects you. And then ultimately we don't get the results. You're out the door. So, <laughs> so you've got to say, I've given you, you know, I've given you quarter, but you still don't want to know, but right, I'm going to, you know, take it in and implement into this into the training session so I can get the best out of you. Cause I, you know, we, we need to win games. I need to stay in the job. I want to be successful. I want to make you successful as well. I want to make you successful, not just me. I want you to get be successful and you to be happy on a on a Saturday or a Tuesday. You know, these the, you know football's hard work. You know, it's not easy, and you got to the harder you work, the easier it, it does get because you're used to that kind of you know that level. Sometimes I come into into football clubs, they're not being training and playing at a proper level, and that's why sometimes the you know the suffering comes seventy minutes. So I'm I go in and my coaching staff, which, which are fantastic, and and we 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 up the training sessions, we up the kind of um, the the volume and the and and we and we push them in the right areas, and then within a month they see a huge difference in their game, and they don't even know. Yes, they might be saying, "God, it's a lot of training or whatever," but. They'll get the benefits, you know, um, a month down the line and six weeks down the line. So you've got to be disciplined. And, you, and as I said before, I pull them in. I say, look, we've got to do this work and um, because ultimately, my, you know, my job's on the line. See, one of the things that fascinates me in um, in, in understanding some of your uh, your career history, Sol, is, is your ability to almost observe and watch and spot signs. You know, that's something that you describe you saw as a streets as a kid going to Lillishaw, going into mm. Arsenal, you saw patterns of behaviour, you saw things that intrigued you. When you walk into an environment, what sort of things do you observe that tell you it's a healthy culture? It's a culture where improvement, discipline, 
and um, high performance is expected? Um, first of all, I go in and see who, who says hello. Things like that. How do they treat each other? You know, are they just, you know, walking past and, you know, not even, you know, recognising anybody? Um, are, the, are their heads down all the time? Or, you know, you, you get a variety of, of characters in football clubs and you need that. You need that. I, even I, I love all that kind of, you know, the banter and all that. And I, I love all that. But you, just the, the small things, politeness, um, you know, being courteous, uh, being on time, tardiness. Are they, are they on time? Are they on time? We're always late. You know, are they late coming out to training? Are they just doing the boots? Are they just, you know, you know, hopping and skipping and trying to put the boots on? Do, you know, yes, I get that. Sometimes you're late. But if, if, is it a regular thing? All those little things. Because they take off. It, it's all respect. If you don't, if you can't get on time or you're injured and you need to be in, I don't know, an hour before everybody starts or an hour and a half before you start, are you there? Are you there? Or are you kind of right on the, you know, on the hour and a half or hour to, to kind of, you know, clock in? Why, why can't you get there 10 minutes earlier or whatever? So I see, you see all those things, those little nuances that what go on and you're going to, you're going to, and then you piece it together. You can't do it straight away. You're going you're to allow it to kind of fester. And then they can see your discipline and you talk to them and, and you see if it carries on or it, does it stop. You, you, you have a meetings with them and you say this is how this should be going. It could rub them up the wrong way, but you know what, uh, what it takes to kind of get to the top. And for me, when I set these things, it's a sieve. You know, you start sieving out who really wants it. Who's committed? Who's committed? You know, if it's the club is kind of struggling or whatever, who's committed? And I need to find that out very, very quickly. I can't keep on waiting to put a team out and then, oh my God, what's going on here? I need to find that out through, you know, training. I need to find out just walking around the football club, how, you know, talk to them, how they respond, what kind of, you know, what's going on in their heads and things like that. So I need all that kind of information very, very, very quickly. And I, I can pick it up very quickly as well. But um, I can't wait until the games to kind of really... You can. Games do, do, do... You do find out who's who in a game and the attitude and, and who they are and half-time and if they're one nil down, who, who keeps them fighting, who, all those kind of things. So you put, piece that all together. But I, I, I learn a lot from the training ground, the training sessions and things like that because you're there more... You're there, you know, 80% of the time you're, you're at the training ground. And and you can you can put a session on and you can see if someone gets it very early on or the work ethic is is correct for the level they're playing and for them to kind of you know if you get that right you win games or you're gonna you know you're you're gonna get you know better results and climb up the table so you you set those things and you for me I, I set them out to to kind of discover very quickly who is who and what's going on and their, and their attitude, the mentality. And you put training sessions on to kind of, to find that out as well. It's interesting stuff, this Damien, because it's, it's so ad adaptable to real life for people who are listening to this podcast and they're not involved in football and they never will be, but they might run a business or work in a business, work Absolutely. in a team and they need this. And I know you talk a lot, Damien, when, when you speak to people about tripwires and it sounds to me like that's what Sol is setting for his players. These little, tripwires and let's see who falls yeah definitely so the idea of a tripwire soul just to explain it is, is <laughs> there's is... no booby trap there <laughs> it's, not that kind, it's not that kind of uh it's just i'm just trying to find out you know what what's the, the level of everybody really you know because sure. i need to find out the commitment it's not like oh you tripwire and like boom it goes off <laughs> no, but the story of the tripwire is um like where the origins of it come from is i don't know if you remember the van uh the band van halen and they were the guys that in 1984, they were the biggest rock act in the world. And Dave Lee Roth, the lead singer, had a concern that the people working on building the sets, like when nobody was watching days in advance, whether they were committed, whether they were doing what they said they would do, whether they were following through on all the actions, so all the things you describe in a club. So he came up with, it's a famous uh, um, story in, in, uh, in rock music where he insisted that they used to have a rider put halfway in their contract, which was whenever they arrived in the dressing room, they had a bowl of M&M chocolates waiting for them with all the blue ones taken out. And that was his tripwire that when he went and looked, 
he he would be able to see if there was any blue trip wires. That would tell them either they hadn't read the instructions or they didn't care about what he'd asked them to do anyway. And those two yeah. things were his trip wire to say, I need to pay close attention to the quality of the work behind it. So what yeah. Jake's describing is you, when you see somebody, whether they shake hands or whether they look you in the eye and say hello, that's a, almost a trip wire moment that gives you a clue as to what kind of culture, how people feel about the place when they're around. Yeah, yeah. Would yeah, you do us a so favour, um, Sol? Would you, would you share with us what, what is the first message you like to give to the players when you go into a football club? You've done it twice now. And I think first impressions count for a lot. You'd never get a second chance to make them. What is it that you say to those players to set the tone, set the agenda, and more importantly, set the culture that you want at a Sol Campbell football club? I think the first thing is for, for me is shaking everybody's hands and looking at them and say, look, how you doing? I'm blah, blah, blah. Because, you know, they, I've heard lots of stuff and things like that. I'm, you know, I'm just a human human being, normal guy. Yes, you know, working hard, you know, as a, as a professional footballer. And I'm here as a, as a manager and I want to get the best out of the club. So first, for me, sh- handshake, looking, you know, who are you? Quick conversation. And then obviously a meeting after as well. So I want to get them all down and, and sit down and have a meeting so they can hear me. It's a massive thing when people can hear you and the tone and, and also the honesty as well, being honest to the, to the guys, because if you're not honest to the, to the guys within a couple of weeks, they can find out who you are really. Uh, footballers are very good at that as a, as a pack, you know, they can work you out very quickly. And then the main thing is as long as you're honest to the players and, and you're kind of allowing people to, um, you know, have their say, or 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 everybody's got a chance until something else happens. I think that's the kind of attitude, and that's the kind of that's what I want to portray. You know, I'll give you the the, the, the slate's clean. Let's go again, and uh, and almost give them the kind of opportunity to because some players, the previous manager, they might have not been playing. They might be um, you know out of favour. No, I want to come in and I say, look, you've got a chance. Prove it to me. Prove that you want to be in the team. You know, I want to, you know, the, the natural kind of selection. I want that to happen. It's, you know, competition breeds success. You should allow that to happen. You know, who wants to be the best? Who wants to stay in the team? You know, and then you create that. And uh, as long as you're honest about it and, and you're fair and, 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 you know, some players, are, you know, you do get the players who, who, who don't play uh, as well, but still want to be in a team and all that kind of stuff. So you get all that kind of to deal with. There's a lot of headaches to deal with, but as a manager, it's normal. Um, and I, I want to portray that. I want to give them as much opportunity to kind of prove their worth. Do you want to be, do you want to play for this club? Do you want to play for this club? It's interesting stuff. And what's great about the position you're in, Sol, is this, you know, no player can look at you and say, you don't know what I'm going through because you had it all. You had the highs, you had the lows, the great times, the hard times. And that's what's, brilliant is that this is all against the backdrop of what of what you went through I want to talk about um, how you deal with footballers who are struggling a bit and who maybe have got issues maybe with their mental health is is that something that you experienced when you were a player mental health struggles at any time I think for me um, you know when I was playing I think um, a lot of people probably didn't really didn't really um, talk about mental problems or or stresses in their lives as much until until it kind of hit the headlines or whatever you know and and it and some players have taken it out in you know in drink and drugs and you know all that kind of stuff so for me you know i you know, i you know i kind of say to myself well i'm from a tough background um you've got to kind of say to yourself life is not easy is sometimes you're going to have some great times, and uh, but sometimes you're going to have some really bad times, and you've got to deal with it. I just kind of go back. I go back. I used to go back to where you know, from back to Plasto, back to Stratford, and I used to think to myself, God, do you know where you've come from, where you are now? Yes, it's hurting. Yes, you're 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 you know, you're pissed off. You yes, you're angry. Um, yes, you know. The, fans are on your back yes the media on your back yes the managers on your back you know yes everything's on, everyone's on your back everyone's on your back but I used to kind of you know retreat and go back into to to you know re, you know remembering those days and reminiscing about those days of of where I, I came from and how how difficult it was and that used to help me 
I know it's not going to help everybody. Some people need external help as well. Some people need a psychologist, a sports psychologist to help them out. Sometimes they need a good friend or, or a family member, um, you know, or you know, a loving arm around them and things like that. So it's it's a mixture. But for me, I went back to that and and uh, and that kind of got me through through life. Just remembering how difficult it was growing up as a young lad, you know. Nine, nine brothers, two sisters in East London, not a penny to rub together. Um, had to grow up incredibly fast as a as a as a kid because you had to, or you just get trampled over. Um, and and kind of went back and simplified your life. You know, simplify your life. I, that's what I did. I I, simp- I I always just simplify your life, and 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 then you can start seeing what's wrong because as time goes on. You pick up things. You pick up. You pick up. Uh, pick up cars. You pick up clothes. You pick up houses. You pick up. You know, bad habits or whatever. You pick all those things up. You know, and the list can go on. But for me, I, I, I kind of, you know, retracted and, and and simplified it, and then I can see what's really wrong, and that's what I did. And I I, I would go back and say, right, you know what, that's wrong. That's out. That's out. That's staying. And then and then all of a sudden you start saying. Do you know what? I'm I'm okay now. It's uh it's not perfect, but I'm gonna build on this. And you build and you build and you go again. And then all of a sudden, you know, six months down the line, I know it's not gonna work for everybody. I know. But for me, and then you start to kind of you can see again. And you can see, and then also you, you can see the warning signs when it start when they start coming along again. So do you know what? I'm gonna wide birthday, I'm gonna I'm 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 I, I know I know that story from the beginning, middle, the end now. I'm on to the next because my goal is, you know, I, I want to make it. I want to, I want to continue playing football for another, say, ten years or five years, or maybe my last year. I want to make it, you know, a really good year. So that's what I, that's how I, how I kind of dealt with it. You know, in the teams, you know, I, you do come across that now a lot now in um, in football and as a manager, you know, I'm, I'm sympathetic to it. There's empathy. I understand that you know that it's sensitive kind of subject, and you need to help. And clubs now uh, are really, you know, they're good now. They're you know, miles better than when I was around. Um, back end at Arsenal, obviously, you know, we had a sports psychologist. Like most teams now, um, with any sense, have a sports psychologist, maybe full time or part time. Um, it's or, or maybe you know, maybe someone there's a priest or whatever, a local priest uh, uh, helping out at the club. So, I think you need as you need all these kind of levers to help players you know you need to talk to them, you need to give them space because it is you know sometimes you, you don't want to kind of um you know uh not you not not kind of check it you got he's the player is is your player you, the, you want them to play but if it's really bothering them and they can't play you got to help them and there, there's a lot of levers now and a lot of people you know um can help these guys to kind of get through and hopefully they do get through not all not all get through. Some retire and say, "Look, I, don't, I can't do this anymore. I want to change my life." And and you have to respect that. And it does happen. Um, but the main thing is you got to give them support. So can which I wasn't ask around you? was wasn't around when I was uh, kind of playing. It came back end back end of the career. But you know when I was you know eighteen and you know, up to twenty five, it wasn't around. So can I ask you about that experience of going back to play Stowe and sort of simplifying your life? Because that sounds like you were regularly updating your to don't list like the things that you didn't want in your life which <laughs> I'm really intrigued about can you give us a specific example of something that when you went back and decided to simplify things something that you did choose to let go of uh i think for me i um i think letting go um after a bad result after you know um losing you know semi-finals of FA Cups back in the days I used to kind of I used to kind of be in a, in the dumps for I don't know like a week two weeks it used to take a long time for me to recover after certain games and uh, it, I think it's because I was passionate about it and and maybe maybe that's all I had you know growing up as a, as a kid I you know I was I was so kind of concentrated on 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 being successful so when it did go wrong I think that's the only thing to kind of, you know, reset. I can't really go back to the family because, you know, the brothers weren't really into that and mum and dad back in there weren't kind of really nestling, not 
maybe my mum a little bit. So I had to kind of reset myself. I had to do everything myself, really. Um, and um, and there's, there's loads of moments for me to kind of reset. And I, I just carried on like that. Uh, just thinking about Plaster, thinking about Stratford, thinking about my, my good friends from, from yesteryear I, I still talk to. Um, I used to go, I used to actually drive back there and, and walk at my local park, you know, West Ham, West Ham Park, walk around and just try to kind of settle myself down and, and put my feet back on the ground and, and just walk around the terrace houses and around the estates and, 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 and just, and as I said, just simplify it. And it happened throughout my life. And I just kept on doing that. You know, I, I would always go back home and, and just kind of, um, you know, reboot. And what do you do now when you have those moments? <laughs> uh, walk around the garden, take the dog around the garden, <laughs> um, you know, have a stroll, you know, over the, over the common. I've, I actually, you know, I like walking. I like walking. Um, that gets me, I know, some guys... Is that like, preferable like to talking to people, So You seem to sort of deal yeah, with it on your I, own. Yeah, that works yeah, for you. Yeah, yeah. No, no, I'll, I'll, I'll talk, to my, talk to my wife, you know, about other things. But f when I just want to kind of just have a little break from the kids and things like that, just have a nice little walk with a dog and, um, and, and nice and easy. And, and uh, it's not always kind of a, 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 a biggie. Sometimes you just need a break and just want to... Enjoy the, enjoy the weather, you know, if it's raining or it's, you know, if it's sun shining, I don't really mind. But a nice stroll um, with dogs, it's, it's great. One thing I really want to get into is, I think it's a brilliant coping mechanism, right? To go back to where you came from, to ground you. Listen, this sounds ridiculous, but when I ended up on kids TV, I did the same thing. And like, it's not quite at the level of competing for <laughs> Premier League trophies and playing at some of the biggest clubs in the country. But even I, as a sort of 18 year old in London, had to come back to Norfolk and just be at my mum and dad's just to remind myself that not to sort of get carried away. So I can't imagine the level that you're at. My question is, what were these coping mechanisms about coping with? Was it pressure from fans? Was it pressure from the media? I'm so interested to hear like how difficult those periods were and and the, the, the toll that they took on you because you you know you were you were dragged through it, weren't you? Yeah, yeah. I think for me, you know, the guys now probably are well protected, and 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 the media are. Are, are, not, I'm not saying they're, it's dampened down. It's not as vicious as it used to be, uh, and uh, and sometimes vile as well. Um, it's not like that now. Mm -hmm. Not like that at all. Um, and there's there's a lots of there's a lot more checks and balances going on. Yeah. What was the uh, thing that hurt the most? Do you remember? For me. Yeah. What hurt I the think most? for me, I think for me, it's all about you know when I left say Tottenham, Tottenham to Arsenal, I think there was a, you know, the whole kind of move was, was um, you know, the pressure, even though London is, you know, a huge city, um, it was like, you know, all eyes on me for at least, at least the first couple of seasons. Um, you know, even though I, you know, I was successful in the first year, you know, won the double, the pressure I was under, and also I was injured as well. I came injured as well, so that even you know I started the, <laughs> on a back foot. So I had to get fit first, and then get in a team. And um, you know, it, it, you know, looking back, I don't think the kind of stuff that was uh, chucked at me um, by by everyone who, who who wanted to put their ten pence worth in, you just couldn't get away with that anymore. That kind of that level. Um, but then, you know, I, I went back. I went back to East London. I, I went back, all those things. I, I kind of simplified my, 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 my uh, lifestyle and just totally was laser focused on making it and winning and getting fit and not letting anything get in the way. You know, con full concentration, commitment. So they lit sacrifice. the fire in you then. That criticism lit a fire. Well, you know, the fire was the fire was there anyway. You know, I'm not. You know, the fire was there anyway because just with the move, I didn't have to have the criticism. You know, on that level, you know, I would do one thing wrong, and someone said oh, I played a bad game. Do you know what I mean? Like, you know, come on, you know, you just jumping on the bag way to kind of because uh, let's bash old Campbell. But um, no, no, it's just laser, you know, concentrating, laser focus to get to the top and maintain and get better and better and better. And that's, 
that's what I did. I, I went back to my, my East London days, back to, you know, when I was, you know, 9, 10, 11, 12. And also allow myself to be free again. Allow my football to kind of do the talking. Um, just get on and, you know, be a team player and break down kind of, you know, uh, the barriers and things like that. And, and just start building, building, getting fit, building game by game, concentrating, doing my extras and simplifying my life. And I just went back to, went back to the old, you know, East London days and be, mm. you know, just a real kind of, not street fighter, but a real go-getter. And I'm not going to, I've been dealt these cards. I don't like these cards. So I'm going to do my utmost to change these cards basically changed my my destiny and that's what I wanted to do I didn't want to I had to win I had to win but in the end you know some people I don't know did they <laughs> it's almost you know <laughs> if I didn't win I don't know what would people say if I you know when I did the move I don't know I don't know but I won is there any element of you that 20 years later is grateful for it do you know what yeah, grateful because I you know, played an amazing side. Amazing side. But, but grateful you know. for the criticism, for what that did for you. Oh, uh, no, because I really had my... No, because I think for me, sometimes I think the media, uh, uh, not so much now, just overstepped step the mark. And it was doing lots of things overstepping the mark, you know, at that time. You know, of, you, know you can go on and on. I'm not going to go on on all the court cases, things like that. I can go on, on all day. Um, and, um, you know, that... I would have I would have made it because that's inside me anyway. That kind of will to win. Um, you know, I I I want to be a success. Um, you know, I I I don't want to kind of finish my career and and have nothing in the in the trophy cabinet. I've got that inside me. So I didn't need criticism to kind of get me to the top. You know, Competing, there was enough competitors out there. You know, there were the teams. There was Man United. There was Liverpool. There was Chelsea. All the, there was enough teams to. You know, that's my competitive side. I, I, you know, me beating. You know, one of the main teams to to win the Premiership. That's all I need. I don't need that, anyone else pushing me. You know, maybe that's the cherry on the cake. But for me, there's enough guys out there who could have you know, enough teams who could have um, won the Premiership around that time. That is my, and that's how it should be. You know mm. that. You know, competing at that level against your peers, who's the best? You know, that's me. Who's the best, you know, back in East London? Who's the best in this street? Who's the best in this area? Who's the best in this district? Who's the best in the county? You know, who's best? Who's the best players in England? Who's the best players in Europe? Who's the best players in the world? That's my, my drive, not someone criticising me. So how does that competitive instinct manifest itself today, Sol, now that you have retired as a player? I want to be the best manager possible if I get the chance. If I get the chance, I want to be the best manager possible. You know, I want to... I'm very good at, you know, getting in a situation and working out very quickly how to get this team up to standard and beyond that. Um, and I want to be the best. It's a journey for me. It's a tough journey for me. It's hard for me. Um, but I'm being positive and I'm going to, you know, I'll, I'll fight all the way. I'll do the all right things. I'm going to, you know... But on a it reminds me. Level, it, reminds, so. it reminds me. Like sorry, it reminds me of when I was young and I was getting overlooked all the time, and I was overlooked all the time in a lot of scenarios from from an early age, and I had to work to get to the top. I just hope, you know, me working in, in as a manager, someone out there, manager, um, uh, hierarchy wise, you know, sports director, sporting director, uh, director, owners, will see that and uh, understand that I have the passion. I I've got the um, the ability. I just need the right club to kind of, you know, work for. I well, want to be. I want to be successful. And whilst I want to come back and ask you about that, I'm interested in terms of how that competitive side manifests itself personally, because you're also a father and a husband. Mm. Like mm. how? So how do you sort of um, pass on these values and these lessons to your children? Um. Every day, you got to do it every day. You, I, I do it every day, you know, because they're, you know, they're, they're from a totally different background and lifestyle and, and environment, and you got to kind of talk to them every day and, and pull them up on every day on all little things, you know, being being kind, understanding, you know, that there's some kids around around the world who have nothing to eat, um, no clothes, you know, 
uh, you know, toys and things like that, giving their giving their spare toys to charity, all those kind of things. So, so to show them, you know, they are they are lucky. They they are lucky, but also to to make sure they don't uh, ruin it. They don't waste all the opportunities. Waste, you know, the time at really good schools. Um, understand, you know, you you've got to kind of utilize every second. Don't waste anything. You know, everything's precious. Uh, your time, your life, um, friendship, all that kind of stuff. So I, we, me and my wife, we, we, we push that and we, we, we encourage that as well. So, and also to be strong as well at the same time and, you know, values and understanding sometimes you've got to stand up um, for, you know, for, for whatever, you know, you, you're feeling and, and, and also express themselves as well. You want them to be artistic. You want them to be loving. You want them to uh, to kind of understand or try to, you know, begin to understand the world and, and want that kind of curiosity in them and finding out what's around the corner or what about this and asking questions. I want them. And I, I, I push that, you know, me and my wife, we push that for you know, to kind of implement that and, and we want that kind of um, feedback from them. We want, we, and that's the best way. That's the only way you can, you know, you don't want to you say, right, you, you know, you want, you're going to, we're going to move back to East London and we're going to live there. You, that's not going to happen. So you've got to do it in other ways. Yeah. And so you sit here as someone who has played almost 100 games for England. You've won trophies at some of the biggest clubs in the country. Um, you've, you've got your coaching badges. You've had experience at League Two and experience at League One. And I know that you feel that if you weren't black, you would have been the England captain on a permanent basis. Do you still feel that because you're black, you're not getting the chances in management? I think for me... Um... You know, the the uh, diversity in 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 uh, mentality, um, you know, is changing. Is changing. I think, I think the hierarchy, um, you know, makeup is probably not changing as much, but the mentality is changing. Right. I think the next step is the fans to kind of start to kind of uh, um, change in in the ways of. Who they would like at their football club and things like that because they're 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 a big part they're a big part and understand you know talent is talent is not just held by color you know mm. talent is held by whoever and you know if you are overlooking someone because of his color you're missing out you're missing out on a great manager who can quite easily you know come into a club and be successful and and be amazing and at the same time. It might not work out, but you don't stop, you know, yourself employing or, or opening up to that idea of 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 someone of colour managing your football club. It's mm. it, it's so archaic and it's not. And you even still in think the... that that is the mindset of of some fans. That there's still that barrier there, and maybe even is it subconscious? That I because I think if you went to football fans and if you went to chairman and you went to boards and said, "Would you employ a black manager? Would you like a black manager to manage your football club?" I do feel almost to a man and woman, they'd go, yeah, 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 definitely. But, so that, but there is then a disconnect because there isn't black managers, there isn't black coaches, there isn't black chairmen, there isn't black boardrooms. So where, I'm just so interested in where is this falling down? Is this still unconscious, subconscious racism where they don't even realise that they're making that decision based on the colour of your skin, but that is what they're doing? Um... I can't really answer that. And I said, I, what I can answer is, is I think the media plays a big part. I think they play a big part and still play a big part in how fans um, play um, uh, hierarchy, how they go about sporting directors, how they go about picking their next uh, next manager. And there's got to be a right consciousness and a right kind of... Um, uh, the, the mindset of of not only changing the manager but also changing the whole club how they is how it's run who who owns the club who's a director who's the doctor who's the kit man who's you know all those things not just a manager you've got to i think you've got to change the whole kind of culture and then obviously the fans have they've got to realize that you know regardless of where you're from or what color you should be open to someone who wants to really, you know, has got the qualifications. Maybe, you know, I don't know, maybe he's not your favourite, um, but at least allow him to, 
have a chance because you've, you're given ABC, you know, a chance. Why not this guy yeah. a chance? You know, you should not, Carla should not come into it. It's it's like, what do you, I don't, in, in, in 20 years time, we'll be looking back and say, what, what are we doing? What are we doing? You know, mm. and it takes time. It takes time. You know, some of us haven't got, you know, that, that you know, time to kind of, you know, wait on the sidelines before people start changing the mentality, the mindset. You know, for me, I, I want it to start now. It's hard for me because, you know, I've, I've got all my badges. I've, I've played for the, I've played for the, you know, some of the best teams and played with the best players, but I can't manage some of the best teams in the world. Um, I get it. You've got to be experienced and, and, and I want to do that, but I want to build a career. But if I can't build a career, I could never, I won't be able mm. to get to the top if I can't build a career. As someone who works in the media, so tell me what you see, what you hate or what, or what you want to change from the media's perspective. I mean, the media, when you look at the media, I think they've got to be, um, you know, even uh, who did the, um, I mean, it's the Danish, was it Danish? Did the, I think the PFA did a uh, kind of research uh, or pay for research. And I think it's a Danish company that they came back and they, they, they looked at England, France, Italy, America, Spain, of, of the commentators, how they would describe a black player or someone who's lighter skinned and things like that. And they showed it was kind of, you know, oh, he's a beast if he's a, if he's a black uh, player or if he's lighter skinned, oh, he's really intelligent, things like that. Those are the things. And that's come out on, on you yeah. know, uh, research that Listen, so I remember it because we spoke yeah. about it at work 62 I remember the number 62% of the praise was aimed at players with a lighter skin tone 63% mm. of criticism was aimed at players mm. with a darker skin tone and we and commentators were s seven times more likely to talk about yeah. players with a darker skin tone being physical rather than talking about Intelligent. white players working hard yeah 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 so you know so you've got that so you if you go back to my career, to 20 years, if you're maybe say, I don't know, you're 35 then, and then now you're 50 and you bought a football club, but you've had 20 years of someone saying that on TV, what's that going to make you feel? Oh, is he, got, is, he, is he intelligent enough to run the football club? Mm. And that's, that's the thing. Well, I am, you know, there's a lot of people from, you know, yeah. black players who are now trying to be managers are very intelligent. I see you know, it, so, but so all, they, so that, all that those is, chairmen is, have been told, isn't it? Is oh yeah, he's he's a heart, he's he's a he's a physical specimen. He can run the lines. You'll put a shift in on a football field, but run a football club, and then you're right. It is that's years and years of being conditioned to yeah. feel that way about black footballers, isn't it? Yeah. See, Tol, I, I remember many years ago interviewing um, Ferenc Soriano and asking him about his criteria for selecting. 37-year-old Pep Guardiola mm. to take over at Barcelona. And he he quoted some um, uh, a conversation he'd had with the American investor Warren Buffett and mm. uh, about appointing a leader, whether that's a football club or a business. And he said there's three criteria that should be applied. One is the energy to do the task. The second is the credibility. So when you speak, that people listen to you mm. and know that what you're talking about. But the third and most critical criteria was the integrity, the ability mm. to role model the behaviours that you're asking everyone in your culture to demonstrate. So what would you say you offer when it comes to the integrity piece that if you were to say to a chairman or a decision maker that was deciding whether to appoint you as a manager, mm. what are the... What is the integrity that you bring? What are the non-negotiables? Uh, for me, you know, one of the things is trust. In it, I, you bring. I bring a lot of trust with me. You know, you got to be, you know, you know trustworthy in, in a position like that. You got to be able to do that. Um, and I'm fully committed, fully committed, uh, hundred percent. You know, I would work day and night and you need to do that at a football club because you want this football club to be successful you want the players to be successful and ultimately hopefully you know you keep your job so I want to do that and the passion you know passion like you can have a bad day a bad week a bad month a bad season um, but I'm never going to lose my my love of football regardless of what's happening out there and then you bring all the, all those things together and you you get a team you, you build a team that can um 
withstand all that and, and win games and get out of trouble. And I can I bring that, you know, in 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 you know, in the uh, bucket fools. You know, you you got to be that. And for me, and then honesty as well. Honesty, the players can work you out very quickly. And you've got to be as long as you're honest with I'm honest with you and you're honest with me. That's 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 what I'm all about. Because everything else, I'll all put you know everything into it to kind of win games and 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 work out systems and make sure players know what they're doing and blah blah blah, fitness and all that. So you'd be you know you, you'd be ten twenty percent more than you know than when I first started. But um, you bring all the, all those things together, all those ingredients. I bring that you know knowledge, compassion, understanding. Um, could talk to I can talk to the chairman but and then I can talk to the tea lady you know things like that you know I, that's what that's what you bring you know you know I can I can eat in a nice restaurant or I can drink in a local pub you know that's that's what you bring me and that's what people don't realize about me I'm just a normal guy yes I've done um you know a lot in football but really I'm really down to earth and you can talk to me and I just get on with it I'm re sometimes yeah I'm a bit switched on you know but you want someone who's switched on at a football club, don't you? You don't want to, you want someone to kind of, hey, that's got a bit kind of pear shape. Can we sort that out? You want someone like that, don't you? You don't want someone who doesn't see things, you know. So, and, and you want someone with work ethic who's going to work, you know, tirelessly to kind of, you know, make sure your club stays up, make sure you you got a chance to win a cup or or win the league. And that's what I bring, and because I'm a winner, I've seen it, I feel it, I know what it's all about, and I just want to pass it on to wherever I go. That's, that was my question, so why do this? Because you've built a career on being in control and you spoke about, as a young player, putting in the effort and the graft and doing the extras and then coping with the pressure from the fans and the media when you got to the biggest clubs. And again, you dealt with that yourself. Yet you've gone into two management jobs. Macclesfield Town, mm. you did a brilliant job. You kept them up, but then financial issues mm. meant that you left. And then you go to South End, where you can't even sign a player because they've got financial mm. problems and then COVID hits and you leave. So... On both occasions, you left both clubs and you had problems at both clubs, not because of the work or the effort or the talent that you bring as a manager, but outside forces conspiring against you. Are you totally happy to go into that world where it isn't about you and about your effort? I think for me, I got to pick, you know, the club carefully next time round. <laughs> <laughs> I think mean, the famous thing, what um, I think Alex, Alex Ferguson said, you know, um, don't pick your club, pick your chairman. And that's, uh, I think that's kind of, uh, um, as, uh, is nine times out of 10 is right. You've got to pick your chairman. Does he back you? Is he, or does she back you? Um, you know, you, you, you've got to be careful because you're going into a club and they can, there's all unknowns, you know, mm. when you first got, get into a club. So the first thing is you, you've got to have that, that trust that whoever's there, um, He's got your back and understands that, you know, you've got a job and, and backs you and, and helps you through this and, and believes in you that you can do it. So, um, yeah, that's, that's, uh, that's me. <laughs> pick my club uh, or, you know, pick your chairman more than your club. <laughs> and as, as, as we sit here talking now, do you feel you'll get that chance? Do you know what? You're amazing. I don't know. I don't know. I'm I'm working really hard behind the scenes. I've got a fantastic document that's taken me quite um, you know, several weeks, and the team behind it have, have done really well. Um, you know, I'm positive. I, I believe in myself, but someone else has to believe in me. You know, there's got to be enough yeses around that table to say, "Look, give him a go. See see what he can do for our club. You know, see what he can do for our club. You know, we've tried A, B, C, D, E, F, G. You know, why not this guy?" You know, let, let's see. We've got to, we've, we've been down that road. Let's see what this guy can do. He's, he's talked a lot. Let's see what he could actually walk the walk. You know, let's see. You know, um, and, I, and also for me, I, I said, look, give me a year. As long as, as, long as there's a pre-season in there, give me a year. You know, not halfway through the season where you've got to kind of pick up the pieces. But um, yeah, that, that's what I, you know, I'm, I'm ready. I'm always, you know, I want it. I've got passion. I want to kind of, you know, it's a journey. It's tough, but I'm willing to take this journey. And that's, for me, that, that shows commitment. As I said before, you know, I'm, I could easily say, you know what, I'm, I don't want to do this. But this is my love. This is my passion. This is what I dream about. I still dream about football. I love it. I want to win things that I've never won, you know, as a, as a player. I love passing on my knowledge of, of football ability. 
you know, all the kind of things, all those nuggets. I want to, I want to, I'm a giver. I want to give my, my talent and, and uh, I want to build a team. I love to build, you know, I, I want to be successful. I want, I, I don't mind working, um, you know, to, to get there. So, um, it's not easy, but I'm willing to take this journey and, uh, I'm ready, but it's, it's, it's going to come down to if someone believes I'm ready or the right club comes along. There's a lot of clubs come along, but you know, I'm, I'm not saying I've been burnt a couple of times, but I want to, I want to, you know, make sure things are right. You know, just the honesty really from both sides. And when you leave a club then, Sol, um, one that is, meets the criteria that you would want, what would you want people to say your legacy would have been there? I think you want to be a custodian, you know, you want to come into a club and, um, and if, when you leave, it's in a better position. And that's me. You know, that's, that's me. I, I want to do a hard day's work um, and make sure people know that. Uh, I want people around me uh, working as hard as me. Um, and that's what I mean. You want a custodian. You want to leave a club that is in a better position than when you got in through the door. Brilliant. It's so interesting to, to hear you talk like this, Sol. And, you know, I, I suppose what stands out for me from this conversation is that all these years, all these lessons, all these things that you've learned, you're now putting into life as a manager. I just wonder whether, before we move on to our final sort of quickfire questions, whether actually, whether it happens or not, these days you kind of feel a bit armour-plated, really. You know, you've been through so much, you've experienced it all, and yet you're still standing tall, you're still willing to go again. I, I have a phrase, never sit in the comfy chair, and it feels to me like that's you. You don't want to just sit at home and think, well, I had a good career. You want to go again. And I, I just get the sense that all of these experiences... A part of your part of your armor. Yeah, I was. It's, you learn that if you, you know, I'm not saying I'm a sponge, but you want to kind of, you need to learn if you want to get better. Um, some of the harsh, you know, lessons can can keep you in good stead, and also the frustrations of not, you know, thinking that, you know, when is it going to happen? Am I going to get in? That kind of, yeah, that can fuel feel the kind of the fire inside you um but then you've got to tame it you've got to make sure you channel it in the right ways and it doesn't boil over and it doesn't be it doesn't get misinterpreted and things like that you you want to kind of make sure you know you use it in the best possible way and and also you don't frighten off people as well you don't frighten people you know um and and, and you kind of uh it's all about channeling it in the right way so so people see it is see it's as like passion and and really kind of the love of football and that's what I want to do I want, I want to kind of make sure people see the real me the real me talk to me see the real me don't listen to someone who's you know two four five hands down the road you know if you really want to find out how how I am or how anyone is you speak to the person and then you make you know you make your, your conscious decision from there you don't make a decision because someone else said X, Y, Z, even if it's a good friend, because everyone, everyone has a different relationship with everyone else. Everyone's got, a new, everyone's got their own path to lead. You know, you might be blocking somewhere, someone from, from a club that could be, so, the fit for that club is perfect, but you don't know that because someone else said, no, I don't go for him. It happens in football all the time. It happens in businesses all over the world. And you, you know, sometimes it's true. Sometimes that person is, is saying it right, but sometimes they're not. If you really want to find out, if you really want to change um, your club kind of future, or even if you just want to like self development as a as a as a chairman or sporting director, have a conversation with someone who maybe maybe is not on your list. Why not improve yourself? You might you might be surprised. So that's how I I feel. Anyway, I think it's really interesting. Thanks so much for being yeah, so um, honest and, and open with us. We always finish all with our quick fire questions um first of all three non-negotiables that the people around you have to buy into what are the three things they must bring to the table oh i said one of them is passion yeah You've got to have passion um and commitment totally commitment C committed to the to the cause and whatever cause it is yeah uh and for me um the trust is it's big for me, trust from both sides. Trust, honesty, you know. 
What advice would you give to a young soul just starting out in play style? <laughs> uh, I would say, you know, don't just keep that passion for football. Train, 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 train by yourself, train with your mates, you know, but keep the passion. Don't, lo don't lose the love of the game. There's so many things out there that could easily take you off the course or, or distract you, you know, keep the eyes on, eyes on the ball, eyes on the game. Um, and it will get you through and, and the love will get you through the game. You know, there's lots of ups and downs in football, but if you love football and the passion's there, you know, you, it'll get you through. How important is legacy to you, So, uh, Depends on the legacy. It depends who's looking at the legacy. You know, legacy for myself, you know, what I've done, how I've done it. You know, some people might say he's done it in a, in a good way. Some people say it's indifferent. Um, but the main thing is for me, legacy is all about, you know, leaving a, a positive mark you know, for the future, for other people to maybe come after you to say, Do you know what, this, he did it in this way, oh, I quite like that, or I might take a little bit of that and do it in another way. That's what it's all about. The legacy of, of someone who comes in after you and they either use it or use part of it. Um, but the main thing is as long as, as long as they use it in a positive way. And finally, Salt, what's your one golden rule? to live in a high performance life? Um, concentration, concentration. Um, don't get bored of, 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 of the ability to concentrate. Don't get bored of it. So many so, people lose concentration in the game. So concentration. I love it. Um, it's been wonderful to sort of uh, go through those amazing moments in your life the ups and the downs and it's it's clear that it's all distilled down now into a man who is as full of passion for football as he's ever been and uh and he just he just wants an opportunity um and I think we all we all agree having had this hour just to sit and talk with you I know an awful lot more about you and your mindset and things and we live in this world where we see a tiny part of someone's life and we just make up the rest of the story. And I think conversations like this are great for, for us hearing the real story. And um, I hope that in some small way, maybe it does help to open some doors that I think deserve to be opened. Yeah, thank you. It was been, it's been a pleasure. It's been really good, you know, Thanks. going through things. And, um, you know, it's lovely, uh, especially so early in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> Please hit subscribe hit the notification bell, give us a thumbs up, leave a review, but somehow get involved with the High Performance Podcast and become part of our growing community. Thanks for being part of the adventure.